to great pleasure. I'd like to introduce Laura Main, who's here to talk about this project that she's doing. It's the, I'll leave it to you, but it's um, about 60s British cinema. Um, and I thought through Howard, we both thought that this was something that we would all be really interested in because it's heritage, media, it's got everything, it ticks all the boxes, it's all very sexy. So um, I'm just going to leave it to Laura to explain a bit more about the project. Mm. She's been talking probably for about 45 minutes, and then there should be time for questions and answers afterwards. So thanks very much for coming, and over to Laura. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you today uh, about a three-year Arts and Humanities Research Council-funded project, um, primarily a historical project, which focuses on... Um, 1960s British cinema. Uh, we're essentially we're mapping the sort of unchart uncharted territory of 1960s British cinema, but also sort of offering a revisionist history of what's already out there. And this is a very going to be a very comprehensive project. It's run between uh, the universities of York and the University of uh, East Anglia. Um, and there are two sides to the project, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, but it's a three-year funded project, and we're just at the end of our first year. Uh, so I will be reporting on some of the stuff we've done and some of the stuff we're going to do. Um, it is fairly early stages, uh, so um, we haven't kind of written the big book or had the big conference yet. So <laughs> that's kind of all in the works. Um, but uh, the reason, the rationale behind this project um, is the fact that uh, when it comes to history, historians are often very split. Again, they've, all, they've often been very split regarding the cultural and the social influence and the impact of the 1960s on British culture. Um, in part because the 60s was an age that was very, very heavily... Um, it was very influenced by media representations. Uh, so in his book about the 1960s, The Neophiliacs, Christopher... Christopher Booker um, says that uh, when he spoke to people about the 1960s, they were often very conflicted. They had two memories of the decade. They had um, the, their personal lived experiences of the 1960s, and they also had memories of the media construction of the 60s, swinging London, the Beatles, pop music, the way it was represented, that international dimension. Um, but that was very separate from their lived experiences. Um, and uh, so historians have always... From about kind of the 60s, people like Arthur Marwick have been, um, have talked about this awesome cultural and social influence of the decade. Um, people like Dominic Sandbrook later came along and said, actually, um, it's useful to think of the 60s like that, but it's also a decade that is very much connected to a historical past and we can't ignore that. It's less about change, it's less about sweeping change and more kind of about the fact that, well, many people didn't actually experience this. It was more a longer process for many people living in Britain. So there's this, there's already this sort of um, disconnect between, you know, the way people think about the 60s and the way they remember it. Um, it also kind of applies to British cinema in the era as well. Um, the 60s British cinema is kind of, um, it's defined by how international it was. Um, you know, franchises like the James Bond franchise became huge in Britain and the States in Europe. Um, and it, uh, this, the industry itself had um, a massive injection of American funding, Hollywood funding. The Hollywood had a huge presence in British cinema in the 1960s. And that kind of uh, was a very defining for the industry. Um, but at the same time, uh, British, the British film industry in the 60s was still very dominated by uh, the sort of vertically integrated studios of rank and associated British. Um, so there was still that element of tradition, traditional industrial practices as well. Um, older styles of filmmaking endured throughout the decade. Um, it was an industry which was uh, still relied very heavily upon adaptations of books, of successful novels, of proven successful plays. Um, and uh, for new talent, it was still incredibly difficult to break into the industry. It was very much a closed industry for a number of reasons. So we've got a lot of competing narratives here. Um, so this, uh, this historical project, we're... Um, it's basically me at York and Duncan Petrie, Professor Duncan Petrie, who are kind of running one side of the project at York University. And we're basically mapping the industry. We're looking at, it's a very sort of industrial history that we're doing. Um, the guys at UEA, we have uh, Melanie Williams, who is the co-investigator, and Richard Farmer, who's um, the other postdoc, like myself, 
And they are doing the really sexy stuff. Like they're doing, they're, they're looking at the ways in which cinema is interacting with other form, forms of popular culture in the 60s, with fashion, with music, with advertising. Um, so they get to do a lot of really fun stuff, but I still prefer what I do. Um, even though they're, you know, it's just, um, they get what you, the less, the less sort of boring uh, stuff to look at. Um, can we move to the... Uh, so, these are the three areas that we're focusing on. There are three parts to this project. So the first part, the industry and its institutions, this is what we're doing at York. We're basically looking, offering a really comprehensive history of um, the financing, the production and distribution industries in the 1960s. Um, and the second part of the project, which is run at UEA, um, they're looking at the creative process. So again, this is this interaction between cinema and other industries. Um, and the ways in which cinema influenced music, influenced fashion, and vice versa. Um, the third part of the project is something that we're both going to be working on together, and that will take place in year three. Um, and that is to do with the ways in which British cinema was branded in the 60s. It's to do with the ways in which films were exported uh, to the United States, to Europe, to kind of international markets. Um, and it's, it kind of will touch upon the ways in which national identity was constructed, the ways in which British cinema was constructed, marketed and sold. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, so... These are just the sort of bare bones outputs. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, two symposia, we're having the first one in three weeks at York. The second one will be in the summer at UEA. Um, and we're basically just kind of getting lots of academics in a room in a few weeks and talking about the kind of history of the 60s, what's been done and what needs to be done and kind of where we're at, where scholarship is at at the moment. Um, we've already produced a number of journal articles, uh, which are, the joy of open access means that these are available to download by anyone, anywhere. Um, and we've produced a couple of things which have just come out in the Historical Journal of, um, Historical Journal of Film, Radio and Television. Um, but we're also going to be, from these symposia and from our big conference, we're going to be doing edited journal collections as well. Um, at the moment, we're working on a book um, co-authored between the four of us, uh, which um, kind of offers a comprehensive re-examination of the 1960s. Um, and it's going to be quite a big book. It's going to kind of look at that industrial history in you know, minute detail, and it's going to um, offer that sort of... Um, the second part of the project the guys at UEA are working on, it's essentially kind of a book of two halves. Um, and the uh, conference we're having will be towards the end of the project. That'll be a sort of major conference. Um, and the other thing I feel to mention in my introductory preamble is that this project is also in partnership with the British Film Institute. Um, unfortunately, they haven't announced yet what exactly <laughs> they're going to be doing with the research that we do and the research that we give them. But it will um, be going towards some sort of cinema season that they're doing in 2018. But you know, they haven't officially announced it yet, so I can't really say anything. Um, but we're also kind of working with them. We have meetings with them, and we're where we find sort of um, you know films that are a bit odd or that kind of. Um, you know, are technically brilliant but have been forgotten in the annals of British cinema history will kind of point it out and um, they release sort of films like that through their DVD label uh, flip side. Um, so we kind of have that interaction with them as well. Um, yeah. uh, so this is just a sort of, um, it's in a way it's, it's sort of quite a traditional historical project which is funny because it's about transformation and tradition but um, these are the sort of collections we're drawing upon. Um, the one thing that is uh, that we are doing is that we are focusing on archive collections which are sort of um, which are new which have just been recently discovered or which are underexplored. Um, so a key resource for uh, us at York particularly um, is the uh, Film Finances Archive. Um, has anyone heard of the Film Finances Archive? Yeah? No? <laughs> um, well, basically, it's, uh, there's a completion bond company called Film Finances, which have been working in the British film industry since 1950. Um, and what they do is, <coughs> excuse me, they provide completion guarantees for independent producers who want to make films. So they're basically like a form of insurance um, in case the film goes, you know, drastically over budget. Um, but they 
they're unique in that they've been steadily working since 1950 in the British film industry and they're still successful. <laughs> I mean, they, they're kind of still around, which is amazing. Um, the second thing is that they have a complete archive stretching all the way back to 1950. Um, and this was sort of discovered by a guy called Charles Drazen, who is at um, Queen's College. Um, and he um, basically discovered this, I mean, for every film they guaranteed, um, which kind of, we're looking at thousands of films, there's about 150 films that they guaranteed in the 60s alone. For every film they guaranteed, they have production information, uh, shooting schedules, finance, memos, correspondence. If a film went drastically over budget, like, for example, something like Dr. No or Tom Jones, Tom Jones went really drastically over budget. Um, if a film did that, then there tended to be quite a lot of tense memos passed between producers <laughs> and financiers and directors and um, the files could get quite large. That's very useful for us. We like it when a film goes drastically over budget because it provides such an insight into how the industry worked. Um, but yeah, they've basically got a complete archive. They've kept everything and that's amazing because production information is one of those, it's one of the things that's really hard to find <laughs> actually when you're kind of studying British cinema history in the archives. So it's great to have that as a resource. Um, we'll be looking at a few more recently acquired collections which are at the BFI, um, which I'm again, not really sure if I can see what those are, but we, um, I've personally been relying quite heavily on the Gerald Thomas collection. Um, which is kind of to do with all the, the carry-on films and the other films that he made. Um, and uh, Duncan's been um, doing quite a lot of work with the Michael Balkin collection. Uh, Mel's been using the Julie Harris collection. <coughs> Julie Harris, the kind of famous costume designer who worked on uh, the Beatles films. So um, those are kind of two main sources for us. Uh, we're also using the National Archives to look at the papers of the Board of Trade. Um, we're looking at the relationship particularly between um, state and industry um, uh, with regard to the National Film Finance Corporation. Um, and uh, other sources we're using include the history of advertising trust. I can't really say much about that because that's my colleague Richard's thing, but I'll come to that later. Um, the V&A for the stuff around fashion. Um, there's a at De Montfort University, there's um, a guy called Steve Chibnall who recently opened something called the Cinema and Television History Research Centre. Um, and he's constantly acquiring archive collections, um, kind of odd archive collections. Like he's got one by a director producer called Frank Cyril, who is not well known at all. He mainly did B movies. Um, but I've looked through that and it's quite interesting. Um, and uh, he's just acquired the Hammer script archive, um, which is an archive of all the scripts Hammer didn't make. <laughs> they were going to make them, they didn't make them. There's a guy doing his PhD on that right now. Um, so there, things just keep coming up for us, I think, is the main thing to take from that. Um, the reason I've got those two pictures there is um, uh, recently I was in looking through the Gerald Thomas papers and um, I found... Uh, the, you know, Carry On Cleo, I don't know if how many people know this, but um, Cleopatra, the big epic film starring Burton and Taylor, was filmed in 1963 um, at Pinewood. And uh, when the production finished, they left behind a lot of sets and a lot of costumes, uh, which were then used by the producers of Carry On Cleo. Uh, <laughs> Carry On Cleo is basically a parody of Cleopatra, and also, you know, that's just convenient. So, um, But uh, these two posters, uh, for the poster for Carry On Cleo was released the year after the one for Cleopatra. Um, and uh, in the Gerald Thomas papers, I found the legal files relating to when 20th Century Fox sued uh, the producers of the Carry On films because they felt the poster for Cleo was way too similar to the poster for Cleopatra. Um, and that had kind of a long statement by the head of 20th Century Fox, who personally <laughs> was quite angry about this. So this is just an example of the sort of things which can arise from the unexpected things, um, which can be quite fun, um, which I probably won't use directly in my research, but, um, you know, it, it keeps it interesting, I guess. Um, the f finally, uh, it's, um, this is a historical project, but it's also based on um, sort of more uh, quantitative forms of research, in that um, when I started the project, I decided that I was going to build a database of all the British films that had been released in the decade, so that's 991 films. Um, and that includes everything, all sorts of information about those films, um, the way they were financed, um, directors, producers, uh, cast, um, studios they were filmed at, uh, and who distributed the films, whether or not they were guaranteed by film finances, 
how many awards they got. Um, and taken together, this kind of is quite giant now, this rambling database. You can, do, you can find out all sorts of information um, about the film industry in the 1960s. And there, there are a lot of really cool ways that you can kind of use that information. And I'll come to that a bit later on. Um, but that kind of underpins a lot of the research we do as well. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about what we're doing at York uh, at the moment. Um, part one, mapping the industry and its institutions. Um, well, the kind of form that's taken over the past year. Uh, firstly, Duncan Petrie is looking at the relationship between state and industry. Um, the National Film Finance Corporation is the kind of state-run film bank which was set up in 1949 to give loans to independent producers. Um, and that kind of carried on until 1985 when it was abolished by the Tory government and became British Screen. Uh, so Duncan has been at the National Archives um, and he's written about the sort of relationship between states and independent producers and between the NFFC and big companies like Rank. Um, we've also been looking at off, doing major case studies of um, companies which were important to the independent sector, some of which are really obvious, like Rank and ABC and British Lion, others which are not so obvious and haven't really been looked at, such as independent artists and Amicus, which is kind of who kind of became the main rival to Hammer. Um, there just isn't a lot of literature on Amicus around, though. There's, a, there's loads of literature on Hammer. Um, and the ways in which, um, in the 60s, this, we've got this narrative of British cinema being very international, Americans coming in, pushing up budgets, injecting all this money into the industry, um, but very little about how um, small independent producers actually continue to survive in this market. Ind producers who were not getting their films funded by American companies, who were not working with the majors. How did indigenous British production survive during the decade? And that is quite an, an interesting story. Um, so I've personally been looking at issues around this area. Um, and also, uh, I mean, the 60s was a time of change for the industry um, on the exhibition side as well, because the 60s is the era where like, films become exclusively made in colour. Um, at the start of the decade, uh, well, the middle of the decade, there are about 50% of films being made in colour. By 1969, 98% um, of films are made in colour. Um, it's also the decade where um, the double feature cinema program, where you go to the cinema to see two films, a main feature and a second feature, and maybe a short film, that begins to lose its kind of um, its position in British cinema. That was always kind of the, the exhibition mode, and that begins to change, and it loses traction in the 60s as films get longer and they get bigger, and people just don't want to spend as much time at the cinema. They've got other things to do. <laughs> they have a life. They have, you know, um, disposable income and lots of other leisure opportunities. So that's quite interesting. <coughs> uh, so this is just a bit about what Duncan's specifically been doing. Um, in uh, the mid-60s, the company Rank decided to um, work with the National Film Co Finance Corporation uh, on a program of six films. Uh, so Rank basically provided one and a half million, they gave it to the National Film Finance Corporation and they said, right, we want you to make six films. Uh, you can have complete creative control, you can choose the filmmakers, and you can choose the films, we don't care, here's the money. Um, that's quite interesting. Uh, the reason Rank did this, uh, Duncan found, argued, that um, Rank was coming under scrutiny in the mid-60s because the British film industry was very much um, dominated by two companies, Rank and Associated British. Um, and the Monopolies Commission was getting on their case. And there was actually a, a Monopolies Commission report published in 1966. So Rank was being heavily scrutinised about what they were doing to the independent sector, kind of pushing filmmakers out towards the margins. So they decided to inject this money into the independent sector. These were films made by kind of independent British producers. Um, Sort of in order to distract people <laughs> from, uh, to sort of, um, you know, show them as being, uh, you know, less of a, an organisation which was aimed at destroying independent producers, because they really weren't. <laughs> um, but, uh, so this kind of was quite savvy on their part. Um, so, uh, and that's the reason they didn't really take a lot, of, they didn't have a lot of creative input in that. They let the National Film Finance Corporation decide what was to be done with the money. Um, so Duncan's case study of this is uh, an article in the Historical Journal of Film, Radio and Television, which you can all download uh, pretty much straight away. Um, 
this is the other thing that Duncan's been doing. Um, there is a there was an independent distributor sort of consortium company called Bryanston, which was quite active in the early 60s in the British film industry. Um, and basically the reason for why Bryanston sort of came into being was that you have these sort of major companies, Rank and ABC, um, who have all the money and all the power, but essentially they're pulling out of production in the early 1960s. They don't want to make films anymore. They don't see it as profitable. So um, like Rank diversifies into, you know, making copiers and stuff, <laughs> you know, they, um, and leisure and kind of bingo halls and things like that. It's a huge company and cinema is only one part of what it does. Um, so they pull out of production. So basically you have sort of independent companies, um, British companies, uh, pitching scripts to Rank and ABC and getting funding and making these really quite, um, you know, creative, groundbreaking films. So films like Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, which is one of the sort of examples of British new wave cinema in the early 60s. Um, and also lesser known, less groundbreaking stuff, like The Battle of the Sexes, um, starring Peter Sellers. Um, and the re and um, But the independent producers have got more creativity as a result of those companies sort of pulling out of production, but they didn't have financial muscle, they didn't have the power. Um, at this time, sort of, in, uh, uh, comp distributors would provide kind of the bulk of the finance for a film. They provide, generally speaking, 70% of the finance. Um, the other 30% might be provided by like the NFFC, that was considered to be end money. Um, so distributors provided the bulk of the finance. So independent producers, small indies, didn't have the money, even though they had the creative um, incentive. So Bryanston was a company which sort of brought together seven or eight different independent producers, one of which was Woodfall, who made Saturday Night and Sunday Morning and A Taste of Honey. Um, and they, that distributor uh, was kind of, it represented the interests of independent producers um, in the early 60s. Uh, after 1964, sadly, it pulled out of production and went defunct for a number of reasons. Um, those reasons are that, you know, British independent production just became a lot less viable. Um, and I'll kind of go into that a little bit. Uh, basically, there was um, these two companies, Rank and ABC, were the two major distributors. The third distributor was a company called British Lion. Uh, now, British Lion was the distributor who distributed independent films, essentially, on the two major cinema circuits, which were run by Rank and ABC. Um, so in 1963, British Lion went through a crisis. It couldn't get independent films distributed on the major circuits. Um, there were delays. These films were held back. And it kind of, this crisis rocked the independent sector. Um, and following the crisis, companies like Bryanston pulled out of production. Um, but uh, it wasn't just down to the crisis. Um, Taste, public tastes were also changing, and it's from about 1963 to 1964 that American companies begin financing British films in earnest. This is when British cinema begins to become truly international. Um, so uh, films just get bigger, they get longer, they are produced in colour, they're, you know, you've got American films screening in British cinemas, you've got epic films, um, and uh, audiences are just less willing to watch stuff like Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, which is a sort of, you know, social realist drama. Um, set in a small northern town. It's just, it's, it becomes, you know, something, it becomes more associated with stuff that you watch on television, like, you know, low budget black and white dramas. Um, so public tastes sort of begin to change and the kinds of films that the American companies are funding also kind of push budgets up as well, which make it, make it difficult for independent producers to compete because they just don't have that kind of money. They can't make films that look that good. Um, so this is kind of part of what Duncan's been doing and that'll go towards the book that we're writing. Um, that brings me to what uh, my research has been focusing on, um, and uh, basically when I built the database I was talking about earlier, I noticed that um, after 1964, films of under 72 minutes, which generally speaking, most of the time, are second features, um, they accompany the main feature of the film in the sort of cinema double bill, um, they just cease completely, they just stop being made um, abruptly. Um, and I was quite interested about why that was. Um, so my work has kind of um, revolved around the death of the British B movie. Um, and it kind of, that relates to what I was just saying about changing audience tastes and uh, independent production 
um, sort of taking a huge hit in 1963, 1964. After 64, these films just sort of ceased production completely. Um, another reason why they stopped being made is that second features, generally speaking, they're sort of low-budget crime films. They're whodunits. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, Edgar Wallace series of B-movies that were <coughs> produced in the early 60s. Um, they're kind of one-hour films which you know, usually feature a detective who sees a crime and he spends the hour sort of figuring out who did the crime. <laughs> it's just really, um, it's something that's, it seems more to be part of like post-war cinema and the cinema of the 1950s than the changing cinema of the 60s. Um, so these kind of, uh, these films had their heyday in the 40s and 50s and by the early 60s they obviously just, you know, they, they die. But, um, I mean, they, I've got a clip of one of these films. It's called Crossroads to Crime and it was directed by Jerry Anderson who uh, also did The Thunderbirds. Uh, but you know that glittering career is nothing compared to this B movie which um, is fairly terrible. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just going to give you the trailer for that. <laughs> This was how it began. A frightened woman forced into a car in broad daylight. <laughs> With two men who had no intention of stopping for anything or on anyone. Stop, you need I brought you here to remind you of an honest agreement. I thought it was quite simple. You run the cafe? We are on the service of the bank. No questions asked. It seemed the perfect location for the perfect crime. A good pull-up that paid off well for hijacking deeds. But now there was a copper on the case, where a copper wasn't wanted. Connie, listen. When I was here this morning, there was a van in the yard. Brown van, do you remember? The Irishman was the driver. Do you know the load's been stolen? Paddy's van, he's no thief. He's not the one I'm interested in. Starring Anthony Oliver as the cop who turned criminal to crack a crooked setup. He's a very special friend. Ferdy May, a gangster boss who never lost out on a job. George Marcel is done, as hard as his name, and twice as dangerous. Done? Yeah. If it's murder, that cop has seen everything. Are you sure he's with us? Miles said if he's crooked, we use him. If he's not, we get rid of him at the other end. <laughs> Only cross. Okay, let him have it. Um, that trailer makes the film look a lot better than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's released by these guys, uh, this DVD label called Network DVD, um, that kind of take the dregs of British cinema and they package them, sorry Howard, <laughs> package them in really nice box sets and um, they somehow managed to make a profit from doing this. Some of this stuff is excellent and I bought the, they uh, released all of these Edgar Wallace thrillers in a set. There were 48 of these films that were shown on um, the major circuits in the, between 1960 and 1964. Um, and they released all of these films in a big shiny box set. Um, so I, I tried to watch all of them, I didn't manage it. Uh, <laughs> I watched quite a lot of them. Um, but yeah, these, these films sort of had their heyday in the 50s and you know, it's one of those, uh, this idea of transformation and tradition, it's a sort of dying tradition. Um, and uh, those sort of one hour films would have been, wouldn't have been eligible for box office returns because they were sold to exhibitors for a fixed price. Um, and they were kind of tacked on uh, you know, after the main feature, you'd watch the second feature. Um, so they kind of they didn't really make a a box. They didn't really make box office returns. So they could only really be made for a limited budget. So the sort of you could only really make a film like this for twenty grand and expect it to be profitable, simply because you kind of get money from selling it to the exhibitor, and then maybe you sell it to television in overseas markets. But you just won't wouldn't be able to recoup more than what you paid to make it. So um, with uh, in sort of 63, 64 budgets, production budgets are rapidly rising. So it just becomes impossible to make a film like this. Um, it's financially just not viable at all. So that's another reason why these films sort of die out. Um, uh, yeah, and I've, 
I'll say a little bit about the connection between these three things. <laughs> uh, now, the first is uh, one of the worst films the company Amicus ever did. Um, Amicus uh, is a company which worked almost exclusively in horror films, and they were seen as being the sort of main rival to Hammer uh, in the British cinema industry. And they, they tended to produce some um, what's called portmanteau horror films, so horror films comprised of like four or five different kind of intertwining stories. Um, and they were kind of most active in the 70s, but in the 60s they did this film called The Terror Knots, which is everything you would expect from the poster, um, and then some. It's, um, it's just like a really sort of plaudy bad sci-fi movie with like tinfoil sets and things, and I'm not even kidding about the, <laughs> the tinfoil if you watch it. Um, and uh, so that was released in 1967, and it was made for a budget of £87,000. The average budget of a low-budget film in 1987 was about 200000 to 250 um, if you kept your costs down. So that's a tiny amount for a colour feature film. Um, the second film uh, is something that nobody's ever seen, probably, <laughs> since 1968. Um, and that is Morris Hatton there, who was Inspector Morse. Uh, but this uh, film was called Praise Marks and Pass the Ammunition. It's a 90-minute experimental film made by a guy called Morris Hatton, who was a revolutionary socialist. Um, and this film is about um, the main character, played by John Thaw, is a revolu revolutionary socialist um, who uh, tries to convert people to the Marxist cause by sleeping with women. He tries, he mainly just converts women to the cause by kind of <laughs> going out and having a large number of sex with a large number of ladies. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's actually a really sort of um, biting, funny satire about the lefty movement in the 60s and you know the, the events of the revolution of 1968. It's a sort of biting sort of pop at the left. But um, it's so niche that only people who were revolutionary socialists would get it. And I actually watched it with a guy who is quite a, um, who's really sort of, um, he describes himself as a Marxist revolutionary socialist. So I had to kind of watch it with someone to get what it, <laughs> what it was trying to do. Um, but that was made on a budget of £25,000 in 1968. Um, and I had to view it at the BFI on one of their steam bag machines, which they keep in the basement. Um, and there's, uh, there's, they have this basement where uh, there's a guy down there who I don't think has seen daylight since like 1985. <laughs> so um, I kind of, I got these, they gave me just this, these reels of film and I sort of sat and fed them through the steam deck and that's how I watched this. Um, so that, that's kind of a sort of um, a feature film made in colour but on the very sort of experimental end of the spectrum. Um, the Carry On films, obviously very successful sort of throughout the decade, um, they really sort of seemed to hit their stride in the 60s. Um, the writer Talbot Rothwell took over from Norman Hudis and started making uh, films which, um, instead of parodying institutions like the NHS or like the police, like in um, Carry On Sergeant and um, uh, Carry On Nurse, they began to parody films, they began to do sort of film pastiches. So, Carry On Cleo is a parody of Cleopatra. Carry On Screaming is a sort of parody of Hammer films. Um, so they began to sort of move into satire, pastiche, parody. Um, but the interesting thing about that is that um, Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas kept working throughout the 1960s um, on really, really low budgets. I mean, these films were made on an average of between about 140,000 to 220,000 throughout the 60s. Um, it's a kind of tiny amount for what they were doing. Um, and it was, they kind of achieved something that a lot of British independent producers never managed to achieve in that decade, which was consistency. Um, and they were really sort of, um, uh, you know, they, they consistently made a profit and they were consistently able to at least break even. So the link between all of these three things is um, entrepreneurialism, basically how independent producers survived um, the sort of onslaught of Hollywood in Britain and what the independent sector looked like at the end of the 60s as opposed to the start of the 60s. Uh, I'm now going to talk about the uh, work that the guys at UEA are doing and you'll please forgive me if I don't spend as much time on this because, um, you know, <laughs> I'm sort of not as, 
I can kind of give you an overview of the work, but I'm not as close to it as they are. Um, but essentially, they're um, at the moment looking at how cinema in the 60s interacted with other forms of media. So they're looking at um, the television industries in terms of how sort of talents crossed over between television and cinema um, and how those two industries interacted. Um, they're looking at advertising, advertising in cinema, how advertisers used um, films to kind of sell their products and advertisers advertising on television. Um, and how cinema influenced advertising and vice versa. Um, they're looking at fashion, the ways in which films predicted new trends um, and the ways in which cinema was influenced by fashion. So this is a very sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, and also, um, well, I mean, you can't really talk about the 60s without talking about the influence of pop music, the ways in which kind of British pop music um, kind of crossed over to the States and the ways in which the soundtrack was increasingly important, like the film soundtrack could sell a film. Um, it's particularly important when looking stuff at stuff like um, A Hard Day's Night. Uh, uh, like I said, they, they kind of, they're looking at more the, the sexy stuff. <laughs> um, the, uh, the fact that most films uh, by the end of the 60s were made in colour is quite interesting. Um, the ways in which advertisers sort of used colour to sell their products is also quite interesting, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, youth culture, um, the way cinema interacted with youth culture or didn't, the ways in which cinema remained quite traditional in some respects and didn't really reflect how youth culture was changing. Um, so yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about Melanie, what Melanie Williams has been doing. She's been looking specifically at the role of the costume designer in 1960s British cinema. Um, so the ways in which cinema uh, influenced fashion and was in turn influenced by fashion, exploring that interaction between fashion and film. Um, she's been looking particularly at the films of, that Julie Harris worked on um, and uh, kind of designers like Mary Quant and how they um, worked on certain, like Mary Quant uh, worked on a film called The Wild Affair, which is not well known, I don't think. Um, no, but uh, it's a sort of um, drama slash comedy starring the kind of up and coming star Nancy Kwan. Um, and it's sort of, um, it's about a young girl who's about to get married. And it's sort of, she, she feels the, the, the onerous pressure of, you know, becoming a wife. And she hasn't really gone out and dated and done things. And she's sort of living in the early 60s um, when the permissive society is just sort of kicking off. And um, she is, it's, it's, it's about her kind of, um, resolving her internal struggles between you know her impending marriage and the fact that she just wants to go out have fun <laughs> meet some guys um so it, uh, it sort of touches upon that aspect of the growing permissiveness and women's sexual liberation and sexual freedom um the hairstyle she's sporting there was designed for her by Vidal Sassoon who was sort of on the cusp of becoming quite a big name um and that was the film was uh, made in 1963 uh, because of that crisis I was talking about earlier, it was delayed and it wasn't released until 1965. Um, in 1963, it was it was a fairly sort of on topic, very edgy, very cutting film. Uh, when it was released in 1965, fashion had moved on. Uh, the ways people thought about kind of sexual liberation had moved on in that short space of time. We had the sort of emergence of ideas of swinging London, so it just didn't seem new or different in any way and you know it didn't really do that well so um, that just gives you a sort of insight <clears throat> into how um, cinema and society was changing in the in the mid 1960s um, this is uh, these are just a couple of images from the Julie Harris collection at the BFI um, so they there are just tons of these sketches um, and this is the uh, this here is, I think, some of the costumes she designed for um, A Hard Day's Night. Um, and on the right is the costume she designed for uh, Darling, um, which, what's her name? Julie yeah, <laughs> that's just brain fail there, <laughs> which she designed for Julie Christie. Um, the other postdoc on the project, Richard Farmer, has what he's essentially done is he has taken a step outside cinema um, and looked at it from the advertising industry. Um, so he's been looking at the, the movement of personnel between advertising and film, the commercials that were made each year, very, some of them very big budget commercials, kind of utilizing the cinema stars of the era and the directors of the era as well, like people like Richard Lester. Um, 
the ways in which cinema and advertising sort of, um, you know, it, lots of people who were directors and who were technicians worked in advertising and, you know, vice versa. Um, so there was a sort of transfer of techniques and working practices and styles as well. Um, and also, you know, it, it was basically a way of paying the bills um, at the time. But uh, he wrote uh, an article for the Historical Journal of Film, Radio and Television about um, this advert, uh, which is for a product called Sea Witch Hair Dye. Um, and what's interesting about this is that um, it's, uh, it's sort of like a 90 second epic film, which is sort of a satire. Uh, it's, it has sort of nods to Dr. No. Um, and uh, the makers of the film were, in the sort of promotional material, um, they were quite keen to foreground the fact that per second, the film actually cost more to make than Ben-Hur cost to make. Uh, for a 90 second film, this cost £16,000, which um, doesn't sound like much, but it is quite a lot, given the sort of short nature of it. Um, and crucially, it was shown in cinemas, because in the 60s, cinemas would tend to, I mean, cinema was massively in decline from about 1950, um, and they were kind of losing, dropping audience figures every single year in box office returns. But um, cinema would start to sort of commercially differentiate itself from television by saying things, well, we provide a widescreen experience, a bigger image, we can show films in color. Um, you're getting a very different experience at the cinema than you would ever get at home. Um, and advertisers also cottoned onto this as well. So see which, I mean, it's. I've got a clip to show you, but it's annoyingly in black and white. The film was actually in colour. Um, it sort of capitalises on that. Um, and it also uh, was shown in cinemas um, because uh, they were kind of, they're aimed at a, a young female audience. So kind of it ticked a lot of their boxes in terms of the audience they were aiming their film at. Um, but it is, um, the case study itself is quite an interesting view of that relationship between cinema and advertising in the 60s. That's okay. <laughs> You two can have sea witch here. <laughs> See if you if you want to read Richard Farmer's case study of that. I'm I'm quite aware that some of you need to be in certain places, so it's fine. <laughs> um, if you want to read Richard Farmer's case study, um, it's uh, again you can download it from the Historical Journal. Um, uh, this uh, this here is a sort of example of the uh, database I was telling you about earlier. It's um, a sort of very small snapshot of all the information that is up there. Um, so we've got sort of all kinds of fields. It goes on and on and on. Um, and basically, the joy of pivot tables means that you can find out all sorts of things about the British film industry simply based on this bare bones information, which is right there. Um, the other good thing it provides is it sort of it gives you a sort of quantitative map of the British film industry. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, when you, 
British cinema history is written by people who prioritise a few films, a few movements, a few titles as being important. So when you think about the cinema of the 60s, uh, people often talk about the new wave cycle of British cinema, uh, British films um, that were released sort of in the late 50s, early 60s, as being artistically and culturally relevant. Um, now between 1959 and 1963, I think there are about nine of these films that are, that are falling into that new wave category. Um, there were 500 films released during those years, between 59 and 63. So what we're seeing in criticism and in cinema history is a very small um, sort of, you know, fo focus on a very small number of titles, a number of films, for very good reasons um, in many respects. Um, in others, not so much. There's a lot of stuff which just simply gets ignored, which hasn't sort of been reappraised, because when people write about the new wave films, for example, people, you know, other um, historians, other critics come and read those things, and they perpetuate that. Um, that sort of view of these important sort of cinematic movements and they just keep on kind of perpetuating that um, and a lot of other kind of information about British cinema gets lost as a result. That's kind of how canon formation works. Um, so this basically gives you everything. It's all the films released by year, um, about a thousand of them. So if I ever need to sort of readjust my perspective I just look at that. Um, so uh, if we just move on to the... Yeah, this is just some of the stuff that I can't believe I'm talking about pivot tables, that's so boring, I'm sorry. But <laughs> this is just some of the stuff we can find out. Um, so for example, taking all these films, uh, now these are just British films, British films defined as British by the Board of Trade and released in um, no, the 1960s. Not, you know, some films were produced in 1969 and released in 1970, they're not included. Um, but what we can find out is, um, you know, these are the genres of films in the top left. Um, that were popular in the 60s. Well, these were the films that were made in these certain genres. So, overwhelmingly, crime is the most popular genre. Um, these are sort of film lengths. That's another weird thing that if you'd ever want to know, I don't know why. But um, films under 72 minutes, B-movies, there were 207. Over 72 minutes, there were 784. Um, of those B-movies, you see here from the table underneath, uh, the genres those fell into most of them were crime films because crime films are cheap to make <laughs> and uh, they're just kind of, they can be shot in a couple of rooms, they can rely heavily on script. Um, so a lot of them tended to be sort of crime dramas and whodunits and that kind of proves it. Um, most active producers, the thing with this is it can be really useful but it can also be really reductive. You have to have a good knowledge of British cinema to know how to sort of engage with it simply because um, one of the most active producers of the 60s were the Danziger brothers. However, they produced about between 30 and 40 really cheap B-movies between 1960 and 1963. Um, because they produced that many of them, they show up as being one of the, the most prolific producers. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of an issue as well. So you kind of have to take it with a pinch of salt. The reason that crime is such a huge genre um, is simply because in the early 60s all those crime films skewed those results so it looks like there were more um, that crime was a more popular genre than it actually was um, so it, it's not really as important and these are just like a couple of examples of things that we could find out so the National Film Finance Corporation this top table is um, it shows the films the, the amount the number of films that they financed throughout the 60s. So they start off really strong and then they just end up declining until by 1969 they're funding a handful of films. Whereas at the start of the decade they're funding, you know, more than that they're funding between, you know, 30 and 40. Um, so that that's kind of, um, that's quite useful. Um, the second table shows you the same sort of thing but by um, independent, distrib by distributor. Um, so these are the films that rank an Anglo were uh, distributing throughout the decade. So again, that sort of, they have a really bad year in 1964. Um, that's to do with that crisis I was talking about before. And it goes up and it's, um, it's sort of, it can be reductive, but it also can give you a snapshot of what a company's doing. Um, the bottom table is um, a sort of a graph which um, shows you how many films were released in black and white and how many in colour. Um, so black and white is on the left, that starts off really strong in 1960. By 1969 there are basically none. Um, and sort of colour film, the popularity of colour rises and rises until by 1969 basically all the films are in colour. Uh, this is our project blog, um, which uh, I've kind of, um, I wanted to use as a way of 
uh, showing the research we're doing and reporting on that research. Um, but it also kind of turned into something else in that um, I started commissioning other researchers who are working in the area of the 1960s. No matter kind of what it is, um, we get some very weird stuff <laughs> coming in, but um, it's basically a way of showcasing our research, but it's a way of connect creating links with other researchers working in the area. Um, and we've had everyone from sort of professors, filmmakers, to master's students, to kind of authors, um, submitting blogs to us. So it's a way of showcasing the, the uh, work of other researchers and creating links between our research and other people's researches. It's been quite useful in that respect. Um, and yeah, this is just a, a, I mean, we're kind of at the end of the first year of the project. We still have a long way to go. Um, the issues that me and Duncan were, will sh shortly be focusing on, I'm writing a history of short films in the 60s, which is kind of a moving on from my work on the sort of shorter B movies, um, looking at the sort of short film situation in Britain from 1960 to the early 1970s. Um, Duncan's looking at American funding, um, taking a sort of revisionist view of that, like profiling American companies and exploring the relationships with British companies, which um, uh, has been done before, but not to the same sort of, com not the, to the same level of sort of comprehensiveness. Um, the UEA guys are looking at censorship in cinema and the relationships between film and television in the 60s. Um, how long have I been talking for, by the way? Uh, about 50 minutes. Oh, wow, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. <laughs> thank you. Have you got more? No, 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 I don't have more. I don't have more, no. Look, thank you so much, um, everybody. Thank you to Laura. I don't know if people want to leave or if you want to do Q&A before you go. Q&A, Q&A. Okay, Grace. Excuse me, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And my question is about colour. Coming from a position of utter ignorance as a design historian rather than a film historian. Uh -huh. um, and I understand that you're representing a team rather yes. than just your own research. But could you just explain to me what significance the shift from black and white to colour has? Um, I'll try. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I, I'm coming from a position of um, ignorance too, because it's not really my area. So I apologise for that, and I freely admit it. Um, I think it's, uh, in terms, it beca like, it becomes cheaper for um, uh, for filmmakers to produce films in colour throughout the decade, I think those those processes become cheaper to sort of make and do. and um, that So it becomes easier, in a way. Um, uh, in terms of cinema, um, the one thing about cinema is that, uh, you know, um, exhibitors and producers, they want to foreground the fact that, well, cinema is losing money at a huge rate. It just is. And, you know, television is taking that audience. Um, and um, even though the reasons why cinema went into decline are really complex, um, the cinema trade blamed it on television completely. So <laughs> they wanted to offer, increasingly offer um, things that TV couldn't in order to draw in those audiences that they felt they were losing. Actually, they were losing audiences to um, kind of rapid social change as well, but they just weren't taking that into account. Um, also, the fact that a lot of cinemas were quite crappy and were closing. <laughs> um, so there's kind of stuff like that. But that's another reason. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... I mean, television started, I think Howard will probably correct me on this, started um, producing in colour in 1969. Um, so again, throughout the 60s, that was increasingly important to the cinema trade. Um, that is about all I can say to answer that question. Can I ask a question? I, I actually was there in the 60s, I'm not asking you, but I was there in the 60s. My recollection of the programming, certainly, at, I mean, this is very early memory, was that the, the programming of B-movies and little packages and uh -huh. things continued on into the 1970s. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're right. Um, um, that's uh, it's really interesting to hear from someone who watched the cinema <laughs> at that time. Um, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, the, the stuff on B-movies, I was talking about um, British B-movies, which uh, stopped being made after 1963. Um, the programme uh, from like the post-war period, there was the, the double programme was in place. Um, it was still very much in place throughout the 60s and throughout the 70s and actually um, sort of died out in the early 80s, I think. Mm. Um, so people going to the cinema in the 70s would remember the double feature program. Um, <laughs> I mean, what I'm saying is that it, it basically in that decade begins to lose its ascendancy. It stops being 
the program. And so, I mean, it sort of changes in the ways that from the mid 60s, um, a lot of exhibitors are still showing the cinema program, but instead of two films, a main and a second feature, they're showing a big long feature, um, you know, like a really, really long film and um, a short film and a featurette and a travelogue. And, exactly. you know, they're sort of, they're beginning to change, work with it a little bit and change it. And audiences aren't necessarily angry about the death of the second feature. Um, it doesn't die out completely. Like American B-movies are still bought in and shown. Old B-movies are still kind of shown if the exhibitor has nothing else to show. Um, the cinema trade were quite resistant to um, not showing two films in the 60s. A lot of people were, um, they thought, well, you know, audience, the audience is dwindling. Um, if people feel they're not getting value for money, they've always had two films. If they feel they're not getting value for money watching two films, they won't come. Um, so a lot of exhibitors were nervous, whereas other exhibitors were kind of thinking, well, actually we have to change the programme to suit the audience's needs. They're not going to want to sit there for three and a half hours while they watch two films and a lot of shorts and a cartoon. And so it begins to change. I'm not it's saying it dies, it dies out. The it British B-movie. That wasn't actually my, going to be my question. My question was going to be, has anybody, has anybody done any research on, on distributive programming? Um, putting those packages together. I haven't, yeah. I haven't found any. Um, if you could recommend something, that would be great. I've, I've yeah, looked I and I haven't. It's interesting how they made those relationships between... Mm. I'd, I'd love to do more on that, actually. Um, I don't, there hasn't really been much, much produced on that. Um, but yeah, it's, I find it quite interesting. Yeah. So do you know any research done on co-funding with other countries in the 60s? Um, uh, there's been a lot of research on the connection between American companies and British companies. Um, interestingly, European co-production starts to kind of not become a thing, but um, there, uh, like, I think there's a co-production treaty with um, France in like 1965 and a co-production treaty with Italy, um, which results in a couple of films being made. Like each year out of 100 films made, British films, a couple of those films will be co-productions with like Sweden or France or Italy. Um, not very many, but co-production with Europe starts to become something which is happening in the 60s um, as a result partly of those co-production treaties with other countries. Um, I really, I couldn't tell you if any research had been done specifically on that. Um, I know there's kind of a lot of work on American, the, the American-British connection, less the so American on Europe. Funding, um, of British films, mm. but are there any actual co-productions with American. Um, well, there are, there are companies, American subsidiaries uh, like Paramount and Universal operating yeah. arms in Britain which are yeah. funding British films. Um, there are uh, co-productions, I think there would be co-productions between sort of independent British companies and those American companies um, which are based in Britain. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of co-productions. Um, and uh, But the American financing of the industry is quite pernicious in that you can kind of look at the database and say there were, um, you know, 30 co-productions between British companies and American companies in 1965. Um, the reality was that Americans were financing way more films than that. Um, it just, uh, American money was sort of everywhere. It was by like the late 60s. Um, we're talking about three quarters of the British film industry um, is being made, films are being made with American money. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's something that influences the industry hugely. And then the Americans suddenly withdraw that finance in the early 70s and <laughs> everything just collapses. So um, it's quite interesting the way they so sort of shored it up. Uh, cultural influence oh yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely. Financial, industrial, cultural. During the yeah. 60s, which would have uh, influenced the cultural revolution as well. Yeah, I expect it would, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jim had a studio in Boreham Wood mm -hmm. from 55 to 1969. And it was, you know, MGM Studios, mm -hmm. completely American and operating in England. Yeah, because I worked in Australia for a long time, and Australia was very influenced by the Australian cinema. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I hope I'm not the 60s I'm talking about, I'm talking about the 90s. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the, I mean, the influence of that on British culture has, was just, you know, massive. It can't really be overstated. Um, I hope I sort of went some ways towards answering your question. <laughs>
us a little bit. Is there any research going on about, I know you talked about actors moving from films to mm. Um, but it always strikes me, and there's another 50s, 60s child, that you always see the same actors. And in fact, um, in that terrible B movie that you showed, there's a crime. Crossroads to crime. Crossroads to crime. There's a, the female actor in there that, that wasn't credited. Is yeah. so famous. I mean, she just turns up everywhere. So kind of famous for being yeah. everything. And there's, you know, there's actors like Sam Kidd. There's loads of them that are just in everything. Is there any um, research going on around that about acting in the British? Um, it's a really industry. interesting question, um, and uh, I can't. I don't know. I can't point to any specific research. The guys at UEA would definitely be able to, um, mm -hmm. and that's actually. Um, that sort of what you just said touches upon some of the stuff that they're doing. They're not just looking at the movement of technicians, the movement, uh, they're looking at the movement of actors as well. Um, yeah. I just feel really disadvantaged at not being able to <laughs> kind of offer just, a full yeah, answer, but, but you, that is quite well, interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, like the, the Bad B movies, you see loads of really famous people in, and they kind of, you know, they cut their teeth on films like that. Exactly. Um, it's almost as if, if, if it wasn't for that kind of B movie, you know, short feature, whatever, it's, that's where people it is quite fun. Like you see Harry H. Corbett in like really bad B movies where he's playing a police detective. Ah, a step toe. Yeah. Because I grew up kind of watching that kind of film on telly. So there was very little um, difference between, obviously there was a film on telly and TV, but they just used to pop up in local Yeah, place. those films ended up uh, having a long cycle of life on telly <laughs> after they'd been in yeah. the cinema. Um, yeah. They showed on telly quite a lot. Yeah. I think Hollywood still has a few... Oh, sorry, there's a question in the back. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, um, Just going back to what you're saying about Saturday Night and Sunday morning, and, and you sort of talked about the pivotal point where the shift, the American content came in, UK independent kind of died a little bit. So I actually looked at, so I thought it started to be well, a really kind of, um, important film in the UK. And I looked at the box, I've got it put here, but the box office on it, it made six times more than it cost. Yeah, it did really well. <laughs> what do you, so so when that, if that is on that pivotal point, uh -huh. what do you think really edged us away from the indigenous content? Um, like Saturday night, Sunday morning, I want to say 61? 60. 60, oh. <laughs> oh, no. Um, yeah, well that, that kind of 1960 was, um, 60, 61 was the sort of height and the popularity of that sort of new wave film. Uh, so uh, I think A Taste of Honey was also released in 1961 and that did quite well. So there's a sort of group of um, directors and producers who are taking, uh, like, uh, adaptations of um, plays and of novels that have already been quite successful and that in turn grew out of a movement in the 60s and the 50s um, the sort of it's often dubbed the sort of angry young men movement um, in kind of literature and theater um, which kind of you know uh, provides representations of working class life um, and that kind of translates into film and the interesting thing about that is that um, some of the files I've gone through on the New Wave films, the people making them aren't necessarily interested in what they're saying or how they're representing um, working class life and issues. They are, it's basically a formula. <laughs> it's like, well, this is, this is proven to be a successful formula. Saturday Night and Sunday Morning um, was, these films were produced on quite low budget. Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, the budget for that was, I think, £114,000. Maybe wrong. 100,000. £114,000. Um, that's quite low. They kind of, it was already, um, you know, t it, would, uh, it was already expected that it might be quite successful and popular, but still the budget was low um, to mitigate against the kind of possibility of financial failure. When a couple of those films began to um, be really popular among the public, um, uh, that, that formula was sort of recreated by companies who, you know, they thought, well, this, this, this sort of film about working class life, these dramas, they're, um, they're kind of bringing in cash. People are going to see these. So we're, we're going to try and commission and you know, directors and producers who are making these films to keep on kind of um, working in that formula, which is making us money. Um, by 1963, the film which um, sort of sees the end of that cycle of films is This Sporting Life, which is Lin Lindsay Anderson's film. 
Um, that was made by a company called Independent Artists, who are not a company that are working um, with artsy directors making culturally relevant films. They're just a kind of, you know, they're, they want to make films which are profitable. But um, this, the new weave cycle, has shown to be profitable. So they decide to back director Lindsay Anderson, who has never made a feature film before. Um, and this, this film is a very wonderful film. It's a very groundbreaking film. But it didn't do very well at the box office. And the reason it didn't do very well at the box office ties into those issues that I was kind of talking about. And that sort of cultural shift and the changes in attitudes, the changes in finance, the fact that the independent sector was really seriously handicapped by a financial crisis in 1963, that was an independent film. So, and independent artists were really savvy. After that film flopped, they thought, well, we're moving to television, that's where the money is, we're not gonna make any more films, and they did. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of very successful for a few years, and the formula is replicated because it seemed to be successful. By 63, it sort of, falls victim to um, a lot of the things that independent British producers were falling victim to. Um, so do you think it's more financial crash? It's partly it's financial, yeah. It's partly financial. It's like the independent sector looks very different in 65 than it does in 61 for British producers anyway. Like not you know, for... more producers, look at the biggest success on Sunday morning, you, you would back more of them because they're yeah. giving you a good return. So that's why I kind of figured it may not just be the financial side of things. I'm wondering what's the it's partly, it's, I think it's a bit of both. It's both financial and it's both cultural. Um, I think Bryanston was a company which distributed that. Yeah, they, I put that on my slides. They're, they distributed the film. Um, but um, Bryanston, as a company, sort of hits the same impasse in 63 in that most of the films they're producing are in black and white and they're low budget dramas. Mm. And people aren't going to see them. <laughs> and that's, and in addition with the sort of financial crisis, in addition with the fact that more and more films are being made in colour, um, this all kind of culminates in a sort of de decline well, it's, it's, in a short it's space of time. To sort of position it against what's happening now, where you've got Hollywood movies everywhere, mm -hmm. the same formula, using the kind of, you know, X Men or whatever, 57 or wherever we are, loads of them. That's worked, it's working financially, and the audience is going to see it. It's a sort of parallel with this in that there's that new wave, mm. new wave, so to speak, in the UK. It was making money, it was doing yeah. well for people, and it wasn't as though it went off the edge of a cliff. You mm. why that didn't sustain a bit longer than it. It's kind of a combination of those things, but I think also the fact that, you know, if, if British Lion, which is the main distributor for those kinds of films, for British independent films, if they're just not distributing films, which was the case in, like, towards the end of 1963 and 1964, and if Bryanston is pulling out of production, that's the, the, the company which funded the film, those two main outlets are suddenly not outlets anymore, so there's just nowhere for it to go and no way for it to get released. Um, and also the Sorry, I was going to say, isn't there something also linked to the colour um, aspect? Because those films absolutely depend on being kind of gritty, northern. Looking yeah. Out. And. No. <laughs> well, you don't think they do? I think you're just equating black and white, grey, with gritty and subject. I'm not. I'm saying for audiences. I think, if, if I think audiences would. I think that that, that that has got a lot to do with it in terms of audience well, as well. As everybody else. It's not what I think, Peter. It's what I think happened at the if time. You see what, what happens with colour. Yeah. You can, you can easily make the same film in colour and had colour been as cheap mm. to Lindsay Anderson, he would have made it in colour. No one avoided colour because they were making a gritty subject of their voice. I don't know. I think what? there is something to be said for the whole of, if you look at, you know, French New Wave, if you look at um, Italian Neo Realism. All of those kind of realisms mm. are very are black and white, obviously because that's the film stock they had, you know, not being ridiculous about this. And I think when colour comes in, it's about getting bums on the seats, mm. you know, people into the cinema, and it does make it does have an impact on the kind of films that you're making. I, I agree, it'll have an impact, but, it, but you know, as a filmmaker, strictly speaking, as a filmmaker, you know, the main reason people make films is to make money. I think I think that's really interesting. Um, like the. The, I mean, the, the New Wave films, what was really groundbreaking and surprising, other than kind of technical aspects about those films, was the representation of working class life, of northern experiences um, on the cinema screen. Um, and that was refreshing. And that was something which at the time was, uh, you know, very popular. Um, uh, it's interesting that this sporting life, which is the film which is seen as the being the sort of the film that ended the, the New Wave cycle, um, it was found, a lot of audiences went to, a lot of people who went to see it, um, it was a real hit with the critics, they loved it. Um, audiences, it was less so. 
Um, and it was seen that this was because the film was just too bleak. Um, it didn't have a happy, inspirational ending. Um, it was seen as being, well, it's just really grim. There's no payoff. Um, and the producer, I spoke to the son of the guy who produced it, um, who was Julian Wintle. His son Christopher was around at the time. He's like, well, we, we just felt that you know, we wanted to change the ending, but Lindy, Lindsay Anderson didn't want to change the ending. And um, we felt that it was just a wonderful film, but just so incredibly bleak, it turned people away. <laughs> um, and after that film sort of flopped, again, all this stuff was going on in the industry at the same time. And I don't know, it just, the new wave died. Um, it's a, a combination well, of... It's new, it stops being new. It stops being new, can't, yeah. Can't, can't have a new wave that lasts... Of well, yeah. I mean, then, there was one film called The Leather Boys, which um, was released in 65. That was delayed by that crisis. Um, and it was made in 63 when it was thought, it, this is going to be really prop popular. It stars Rita Tushingham, who is, you know, um, really popular at the time. And it's got new wave influences. It's got those working class themes. It deals with themes of homosexuality. This is very on topic. Um, and then it was delayed. And it was released a year and a half later. And it didn't, I mean, it was just, it was like a relic. It was only released a year and a half after the crisis, but it was already a relic. Cinema had moved on. Um, yeah. Um, what you've covered here is about kind of British cinema in the 60s and its impact within Britain and how just the success and distribution within Britain. But have you looked at how British films were exported out to the rest of the world as well and how they were perceived and how successful yeah, they were? Um, a third of our project will be that, but we just haven't got there yet. I'm <laughs> looking at sort of, um, yeah, how, how films were exported, how films were distributed in foreign markets, how they were marketed. Um, also kind of ideas about uh, your British national identity and how people viewed British films and how that identity was constructed. That'll all be something that takes place uh, it's more towards the end of this year. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't really say anything about that just now. It'd be interesting to see how that, the ones that are the successful ones that get sold abroad, then kind of come back to reshape that kind of memory of what mm -hmm. like you that's were interesting the yeah that happens that that happens continually in british british cinema like that was happening in the 90s i think i don't know if it was four weddings but there was a film that was huge but it was released in america first i think the the crying game was released in britain first in 1992 and it flopped then it went to the states it became huge and then it came back um, the four weddings and a funeral, it was thought, well, American audiences are basically, if it's popular in the States, it'll be popular here, but it doesn't work the other way around. So it was released in the States first, given a platform release. When it became popular, it came back. So it's like this sort of American, Americans um, write our, cinema, our culture in a way. If it's popular there, that, those tastes define what will be popular here. It's quite interesting, that relationship.